Good evening. Good, evening. Good, evening. Good, evening. Good evening. Welcome. This is Ryan Miller from Parent Dome. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a commercial coming on. I'm not sure if I'm right on the right channel for some reason. Good evening. This is Ryan Miller from Parent Dome, where I speak about awareness, oversight, and controls about keeping your kids safe in a digitally immersed life. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off with a disclaimer that I am not a lawyer. I'm not a psychologist or a therapist, um, not a law enforcement person, but these are all part of the resources that I have in speaking to the authority on the topic in which I speak about, about keeping kids safe in a digitally immersed life. And there's two topics which I'm going to be going over this evening. Um, the first one is based upon a, a, just an awareness I had this evening that I've we felt uh, mutually it was an important topic to go over, and that is about live streaming, legal responsibilities, and some certain behaviors that are manifesting themselves right now. The other topic is related to cyberbullying and a difficult story that I think is a very important to share with a broad audience. So first back to the live streaming. This seems to be a hot topic and will be a recurring topic because it becomes more and more popular. As I mentioned last episode, the Periscope is the number one app of the year of 2015 from the App Store. So <clears throat> recently, in a social media platform identified as Blab at BLAB.IM, there has been an increased frequency of minor children gaining access to this platform and participating in this platform. Now, there are age restrictions for coming into that platform on live streaming. Unfortunately, it is another anonymous platform which is tied to Twitter that those people that are broadcasting are adults. The majority of them are adults, and they may have children in the side role. So the language and the conversation topics are going to be adult in nature, and the, there is no regulation or requirements on how they handle themselves in that social media platform. So it can be a, a free flow exchange of information, ideas, and even images at times. And minors, through the veil of anonymity, may not be known to the broadcaster, the person that's taking a seat in that social media platform. Now, there is an expectation of the broadcaster who is hosting this four-person conversation that if they were to identify a child and or verify a child, they are with the decision as to how do they handle it personally. They can request that the room modify its behavior because of the presence of the child or they could elect to not modify their behavior and the child is going to consume what is adult content or they could choose to block that minor child. But there is no hard, fast rule that is dependent completely on the person that is hosting that, that situation to make their own personal determination about how to handle that because there's, there's no legal requirement. Now, there is a, a requirement, legal issue, but it doesn't transact between those that are running a blab or the child coming into blab. It has more to do with who is the legal contract holder of the data connection way in which that child is participating on. Because the, the child got access to the internet through somebody's internet gateway based upon somebody's device, which may or may not be legal. So we as parents have a contract with our cellular providers, with the phone device companies, with the broadband connection into our home, we have an actual contract that has an underlying terms of service. And many people do not read those requirements, but it does have a behavior policy attached to it, an appropriate use policy attached to it. 
the fact that you may allow a minor child to gain access to areas which are illegal or inappropriate, that comes back to a responsibility with you. So the discussion I was having prior to broadcast is what happens to the person that allows that minor to come in? Well, really not a whole lot, not a whole lot can happen because they're adhering to the terms. The person that's coming in is violating the terms, so you have to go back in the chain to find out where the actual infringement occurred. Now, I, I'm not sure if I shared last week about the live streaming that I found in a school, school situation that a teacher was live broadcasting their students. Well, this week there was several more videos of teachers in New York and Chicago and Texas and Colorado live streaming their children. Christmas holidays seems to be a, a way that teachers want to demonstrate that this is what's happening in their classroom. So this was happening at a more and more frequent rate that I have downloaded these. I have sent letters off to the school district referencing the Child Online Privacy Protection Act of 1998, which has been modified in 2013. The school's response has been, no response. They send me a form letter which is not related at all to the topic of the teachers live broadcasting captive students. So they don't want to address it. There is a legal violation of those teachers broadcasting via COPA. The same thing happens with this live streaming platform in Blab and or other live streaming environments where minors are involved in being live broadcast. That COPA identifies these areas which children are expected to have privacy. And the fact that the child is violating their own privacy and they're, and somebody else is broadcasting their weakness and understanding that they're, they're giving up their privacy, it's still going to wind up coming back to the parents. Now, again, I'm not an attorney, but this is the logical framework I have other evidence that shows that this is a logical step relative to other things that have happened regarding transmitting of uh, personally identifiable information. So uh, it was a great conversation and something to be aware of because most live, live streaming platforms are required to be 18 years of age. Some have lower age requirements, but the thing that parents need to keep in mind is that nobody can enter into a contract with the minor. So it, and there is no verification of anybody's age when they click the I agree button or the download button. So it's going to come back to you. So this just kind of reinforces my point that as parents, we have a, a real citizen, digital citizenship responsibility to increase our awareness of these dangers, risks, and threats that are out there. And in my earlier conversation tonight, I, I mentioned that the fact that we may know have the knowledge on how to use technology, it's going to take a long time for us as a society to figure out the appropriate wisdom in use of that technology. And bridging the gap is how do we keep our children safe during that time frame? So um, I, I welcome dialogue, input, feedback, conversation. If you want to come in and ask me questions or, or uh, have a little back and forth, I offer that at, you can call in at 919-518-9773, or you can come in on Skype at Computers2KVoice. Again, my name is Ryan Miller. I'm the founder of Parent Dome. And uh, the, the next topic is probably going to dive back into this one a little bit, but it's a little bit more difficult. This is something that, that happened, transpired last Sunday, and it and it's taken me a while of this week to process, and honestly, I have not processed this completely because I've had to rely upon other people more skilled than myself in how to deal with the journey that I've been on for the past, past week. So last Sunday, a 14-year-old young boy decided to end his life, took his own life. And I was notified late Sunday of this event because it had been – there's been discussions with me relative to my activism on the internet and trying to help keep, keep kids safe that I'm aware of certain situations which are 
very tense and dangerous. Um, this one I didn't know specifically. I knew because I was advising someone that was aware of this kind of bad thing happening. So I came aware of it after the fact that the child had taken his life Sunday. And the parents had contacted this individual and said, could you talk to him and see if he could do some exploration on our child's social media to see if there was any indication that would have led up to this? Was there something that we didn't see that would have prompted this kind of activity? And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to help. This is a very difficult task that you're asking, um, but I am willing to do that. And I will, I will go and do some investigation to see what your child's social media, what the child's social media activity had been. So they gave me three, three accounts, three, three platforms. And I'm, I'm going to refrain from identifying geography, people name. I've already re revealed the age and gender, but I'm not going to reveal the social media platforms uh, either. And you'll, you'll understand why I get to that in a, in a moment. So I took these social media platforms and I figured I would do my initial search not at the very end of time. That would be a Friday or Saturday before this child. I wanted to start at the other end of the equation to see where, where things could have started appearing bad. So I, there was some social media activity that was happening at around 2008, but I saw a spike in activity in around 2010, 2011. So around the time frame 2010, 2011, I saw an incredible amount of activity during a certain time period that I don't know of any human being that would have been able to endure what was happening at this time. So I was reading through it and I got to, what I did is I, I took my computer screen and I compressed the size to see how many comments that I could get maximized on one page view, one, one view. And I got 75 comments on one page. And I needed to count how many pages on one topic, like on one post, one, one specific post happened to be a video that this child had recorded on a social media platform. One page had 75 comments, and of those 75, of those pages, there were over 400 pages on that one video. I took the opportunity to read through some of those comments, and at the rate of 25, horrible, horrible, horrible comments. Somebody would come in from the outside and try to make a positive comment to make, to negate those 25 negative ones. Well, that person all of a sudden became the anger of those 25 comments and then that person would disappear. And then another person would pop in and try to respond to this other hateful, mean stuff. And when I say hateful and mean stuff, it's like, some of it I can't even repeat because my mouth refuses to utter that kind of language, but some of it was, you're a waste on this planet. You consume too much oxygen. We need it. You might as well go kill yourself. Why don't you die now? Kill yourself, fat pig. I mean, and I'm just, this is the moderate stuff. This is the very moderate stuff. And I'm reading through this. And I had to take a break because I could not personally handle it. So I decided that I would go back instead of being stuck in 2010, 2011. I wanted to go back in time. And I went back in time and then I found that there was an incident that happened in this child's life that he had been taken advantage of sexually by somebody within his community. There were no names or details other than the story behind. And I thought, oh my gosh, so a number of years ago, this child is a victim. Nobody knows that he's a victim. Here we've got this period of time, it's bubbling inside, and now we've got this other level of stuff going on. 
So I'm communicating this with my Periscope community saying, this is what I'm finding and I'm, I'm having a tough time. They knew I was having a tough time. I had to leave. I needed to get some help for myself because all of a sudden I'm, the, I'm o- operating under the request of a family that is grieving. They're burying their 14-year-old child. Nobody should be in the position that they're, they outlive their children. Nobody. And they're asking me to look to see what kind of impact may have been happening through social media. There is no way in the world I can come to them right now and tell them anything that I have found. I can't say anything about what I found. That they, this will mess them up for the rest of their lives knowing now they may be they, – they could be psychologically pained that they will be in a state of denial that this had nothing to do with them. But the one point that I keep coming back to over and over and over again is absent of any oversight, seeing what your children are actually doing, liking, sharing, commenting, viewing, photoing videoing, if you don't see it, there's no statement that you could make that is truthful about your child connected to the internet other than they're connected to the internet. That's the only truthful statement that could be made because you have no evidence to say what that connected experience looks like because there's no evidence to it. And these parents... I don't know what their visibility was into this child because honestly, if they had visibility into this child's life back then, five, six years ago, I would have hoped they would have had intervention. They would have had a conversation. They would have restricted their child's visibility onto the internet. I move along and I'm going through this video history and I didn't. This happened on Monday where it really messed me up and I needed to take a break. And I took a step away from it on Tuesday. I came back at it on Wednesday. And I moved ahead in time and I see another video. Same volume of comments. I'm not going through the comments. But the video was in response to things that happened earlier. But what I saw was a a young boy talking into a computer pleading, pleading, please stop. Now this child had, I'm assuming, some minor challenge, had a little bit of a speech challenge. He was a little overweight, but nothing in this society that you would identify as being a little overweight. I mean, he was just a normal kid. And he's pleading on the video camera for people to leave him alone. He's just looking for some friends. These are the things I like. This is what I like to do. How come I can't find anybody that likes this stuff, likes playing Minecraft? He likes this boy band. And people were just coming on top of that video in the comments and just it was layer upon layer upon layer of hate. And the My only framework to look at this is that this child had evidence prior to taking their life. Now, I didn't find out until Thursday, Thursday, like mid-afternoon, that I moved forward in his timeline that he had actually written that he had been playing the asphyxiation game. I don't know if people know what that is, but it's the way it was described to me that he would restrict his oxygen flow to the point that he would pass out. Now, that, that's, that is a step right before suicide. It is almost suicide because there's no way to ensure that he could revive himself if after blacking out. For me, that would be an immediate, immediate scream that this child needs help. 
needs intervention, needs therapy. The family needs intervention. It needs help. It needs therapy. If that was if that was confessed in a psychologist office, a psychologist is a mandated mandated reporter. That would be a mandated phone call. Absolutely unencumbered. Get on the phone immediately. I have a child that is at jeopardy of causing harm to himself. Maybe not to others, but to himself. That would be a 72-hour supervision intervention. I don't – I wasn't able to discern if the parents knew of this at all. I am wondering what the heck are the parents doing for this period of time that they have no idea as to what this child is doing. And I can tell you that based upon my own personal experience in the, the tons of people that I interact with, that there are behaviors that children manifest that are indicators, the, the symptoms in advance of the evidence. And these symptoms I am reluctant to share with a large group of people because this may ring a little too close to home. If you allow your children to have technology in their bedroom overnight, you have gotten yourself in a position that you have truly decided that you don't want to know. And my message in a broadcasting forum is something that people want to spit out because it's already too far. And when I start revealing these symptoms, it's going to be like, is he judging us? And I'm not judging you people. I'm not. I am desperate to save these lives. If I have my drapes up behind me, the amount of kids that are at risk based upon parents' ignorance. I'm going to share. I need to change the topic for my own uh, mental health. I do presentations at schools, scouts, youth group, and most of them are with children. I can't get parents to show up to an event. They just won't show up. Maybe 10% will show up. But I'm talking before an audience of two, three, four hundred children. And it's an interactive, interactive discussion to start with. And I have them all stand up and I and I and I draw it out because I'm trying to build suspense with them. And I say, and they're they're fidgety and they're moving around. I said, now everybody you gotta put your phones away because this is this is a technology kind of conversation, but I need you to put your phones away. And I need you to separate your feet enough because I'm gonna have you close your eyes and I want you to maintain your balance so you don't fall over. And if you need to hold on to somebody, that's cool. Because what we're gonna do is I'm gonna have you close your eyes, I'm gonna ask you a question and count to three. And when I'm done counting to three, your answer, I want you to sit down if you have the answer no, okay? And for everybody that's sitting in here, I want your ears to be the judge of how big of an, big the answer is because you'll hear how big of an answer it is just by how many people sit down. So everybody, please close your eyes. I'm going to ask my question, and then I'm going to count to three. How many of you have been involved in, participated in, received or contributed to really mean and nasty, threatening, scary behavior on the internet. If you have if that has never happened to you, I want everybody to be quiet. If it hasn't happened to you, I want you to sit down. But I but wait, I'm going to count to three, and I want everybody to, in this auditorium to hear how many seats go down, how many people sit down. So you ready? One, two, three. And you know, in that entire 400 audience, there's a few. There's a few. There may be five, depending upon the school. There might be as many as ten, but never that many. Never more than that. Never more than that. So I said, "Wow! Open your eyes for a second and take a look around." And they're, they're reacting. They're reacting because they're looking at their friends. They're looking across the way, and their eyes are like, like tennis balls. So I, I got one more question for you guys, and this is the hardest one for me to ask. 
but I need you to go and get your balance again. I need you to close your eyes. But this time, when you say no, I want you to sit down fast because I want everybody to hear that. So here we go. All of you kids in here that have participated in this activity that you just agreed to, how many of you wish, wish your parents were involved? If you said, no, I don't want my parents to know this. I wish they didn't know. I want you to sit down. Ready? One, two, three. How many people do you think sat down at that request? Do you think there was an echo in that auditorium of every kid wanting to get down because they didn't want their parents to know? It's not the case. It's not the case. There were a couple. There were a couple. But the, the majority of the kids remained standing. So what that says to me, standing in front of me, all of their friends, they admitted to me that they want their parents to know. They want their parents to know that they're in trouble, they're, there's bad stuff happening. But here's the conflict. A child doesn't want to go to a parent and seek additional restraint. They want the freedom, as much freedom as they can get. But the conflict is they want to be loved in safety. And here's what the kids tell me in private. The hockey player that I intervened that came in my periscope that I did what I did to, to get that kid going in a different direction. These kids are saying, I want my parents to love me even though it's not going to be nice because it's going to restrain me. But they want the parents to show their love in action, not their love by permissiveness, by love in action, keeping them safe. Because the kids are putting on a face that they are safe and brave, and inside they're scared. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the degree of their scaredness or the degree of their participation. But the overarching thing is it is a reality to them that they are either receiving it or participating in it. They're acknowledging that they want their parents to have oversight on them. We all know the kids are not going to come over and say, hey, can you give me more, correct, more restrictions? That's never going to happen. But they are desperate for their parents to be the parent. People that are listening to you, to me, I don't know where you are, where, what you think of what I'm saying, but I will tell you something. You can call in at 919-518-9773 or Computers 2K Voice. You can share your thoughts with me. It's very hard for me to be out here. I want to do something real quick. Bear with me for one second. I think I've shared with you before what those post-it notes mean. I have to stop getting post it notes because at this point my wall would be absolutely – my entire office would be covered with them. And you know, I get people that I interact with on a daily basis that are saying, wow, Ryan, we appreciate what you're doing. You're bringing this to our awareness that is there an app that we can get? How do we secure this? How do we, how do we take care of this? But, you know, every time I reach out and I, I – honestly, in the chat role, I have said to receive a free child agreement, just post your email address. 
this is the the base relationship between you, your child, and the relationship with technology that sets the boundaries for how to set the relationship. No, I don't know how you're listening to me or how you're seeing me, but it's just to take the first step and looking at how how to change the nature of the relationship between your child and you relative to this technology. Honestly, parents have a tough time clicking on a link. I understand my message is a hard message, but these children, the victims are the victimizers. And I understand that parents want to continue to say it's not my child, lacking any evidence that would support that claim. For the past week, my Periscope audience has requested of me on how to teach them to be advocates on Periscope for other parents' kids that are in danger. They're like, Ryan, you've got an incredible voice. You know what's going on. You know what the different types of trolls are. Can you teach us through Periscope? So I go on Periscope. I create three series of lessons. I talk about the behavior. I talk about the psychology. I talk about the grooming. And then I talk about how to be an advocate to protect other people's children on the internet. But then here's the other side of the equation, which I had to start the foundation of this statement with. I had to do it with the disclaimer. I said, first of all, you are going to receive massive, massive humiliation, judgment, and horrible words coming from the parents when you get to the point that the parent has now found that you're trying to protect their child. The parents don't know what's happening, and then you're talking to this child, you know what? kiddo, you need to turn off your location settings because you're letting everybody in the world know where you are. You know, kid, wearing this kind of stuff is bringing in these nasty people. You know all these nasty words? You need to learn how to block these people because these are the people who are trying to cause you harm and get you to do something. Oh, by the way, kiddo, this is a live video record. It's being recorded what you do now doesn't disappear, that other people are going to use this and that they, they will see it in your future. The parents don't want people to talk to their kids like that. They just want to trust that their kid is okay. And there are hundreds and thousands of these kids on the internet just on Periscope. That my own Periscope audience is saying, Ryan, teach us how to have this conversation. And I said, first of all, I need to give you a disclaimer because you don't understand what the other side of that equation looks like. The other side of that equation is when you're going after those offensive people that are affecting those children, you put a bullseye on your back, that those evil people are mad at you that you're taking away their, their prize. You're, you're, you're eliminating their ability to have success on their conquest. And if they have more technology skill than you do, that the blowback will be very hard and very dangerous. Me, I have a huge, huge bullseye on my back. My home router has got three levels of defense on it because it is being hammered all the time by predators. When I broadcast, I broadcast from alias locations because people cannot know where I reside. I am being approached by law enforcement because of the things that I have to report on. I am one guy with people now that want to take on this, and I am having to warn them the risks, threats, and dangers that they're going to receive themselves. These children over here are in tremendous pain. These are the little boy that got to a point that was on the other side of that equation, that all those people were attacking him, that he couldn't take it anymore, and the parents didn't know they existed. Chose that by putting technology in their hand and limiting the time they could, they could participate on it and maybe block a website or two, that they're trusting that it's okay. What's really amazing is I don't know how many people are listening.
either I have very little feedback from this audience relative to this message. And there's only one logical outcome that I can have, and it has to be consistent with statistics. It has to be. There's no other answer for it. It's not my kids. It's not my kids. My kids, I've, I know everything that there is to know, and I know everything that they're doing, and I know what their sites they're going to, and I, I know I have access to their Instagram account. That's the responses I get. I have access to their Instagram account. I have access to this profile. I, I know they have a Vine account. But you have no oversight. What is 96% people? <laughs> when I talk about the Vault application, Maybe I've talked about it before here, but when I talk about the vault application, parents are like, what are you talking about? I'm like, really? I appreciate that, Vic, and that's I, – I really appreciate because Vic said, I don't know what to say. And that, that is – honestly, that is the most honest answer I could possibly have because I don't know what to say is a great answer because it's not a matter of – what you can say, it's me really honestly pleading with you, if you are parents of children, to change the nature of your relationship to, to, the, to the point where you will begin oversight. That's where it starts. And honestly, it will be hard if your child is in the teens or older. That is, a, that is the truth. But I role play that conversation. I role play that. So let me let me explain. Let me explain that I don't expect parents to know how big, broad, deep, wide this is. I don't. But I want to draw attention to that this is a reality and that I want to be part of your solution if you so choose to embrace wanting to provide safety for your child knowing that the foundational step I say is we need to have oversight. So if you want to take that journey, I will help you with that journey. I have so many ways that I can help do that. And the, the, the curriculum I have talks through that. But honestly, if that curriculum is too overwhelming, which I can understand that, that it was meant for you to pick and choose it at a time that you needed it, I will have conversations. I do webinars. I do private consultations. I do private video conferences. Earlier, I was on a private conference with a guy from California, Vancouver, Toronto, and the UK. And then I'm talking to them and they're asking me questions. How do I facilitate this conversation with my child? And I said, this is going to sound foreign to you, but really, it's a lot more words than you think you you think you can streamline your way through this, but it's not. We have to use more words. We have to use age-appropriate words, but the first words that come out of your mouth should be, I love you. Child, children, I love you. That's the foundation thing. If you don't love your children, then don't say it. But if you truly love your children, say it. The next words out of your, out of your mouth is, holy smokes, I just have my ground shaken a little bit, and I'm nervous. I need to have this conversation with you. The things that I want to talk to you about are not about you. They're not about you, my child, that I love. This is about what I know is going on outside of there. And I just learned that there's some really bad stuff going out there, and I don't know how it's coming into you. So I'm not saying it's coming into you, but what I need to do based upon what I heard is I need to make sure that I am doing my job as your parent to keep you safe. And right now, I just want to talk to you. And in this conversation, you continually tell them that you love them and that I want, to, I want you to show me what you have and how you use it. So 
So I just got a note here that people are definitely listening. I wish I could tell you about the reactions of the kids and adults. I talked about being safe at the workshops. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. I appreciated that. That that was um, that was a, a piece of information that I did need to hear, and I thank her for telling me that. When I again, I'm not assuming that the child is doing something wrong. But now I'm getting in the, the family, the father, the mother, and the child that I want to just see what you're doing and how you're doing it. And I want to have a way moving forward that I can see how this goes. And I think there's some stuff on here that we may, may need to take a closer look at. But you don't need to open the entire gate day one and peer through everything in this crisis mode. No. This is about reshifting re and refocusing, and you can't do it all in one day. This is an ideological shift. Now, here's the other piece of that equation, is that when people think about the oversight as an invasion of privacy, well, you know what? It is an invasion of privacy, but there is no expectation of privacy in your home except for with their child and their bedroom and their bathroom. But, but here's where really the real critical piece – People make a mental leap that this oversight all of a sudden requires a conversation. No, it does not. That is a mental leap that people have made on their own because I say as a parent, I would hope one of our objectives is to develop resiliency in our children and have them learn critical thinking and discernment and reasoning. But here's the key. If you see what's happening with your child with this oversight and you see this nasty activity come in at your child, you can sit on the sidelines and watch how it plays out. You can see how far they're going away and whether you want to let them stumble, get bruised, whether you want to let them fall and break a leg. Or do you want to come in and throw a mattress underneath of them so they get a nice cushy fall? Or do you want to possibly have a conversation and speak into them as a parable, not referencing their actual encounter, but to do a life, law, life lesson parable communication with them? I would appreciate if, if um, those that have been listening to this, this may be a new, new way of thinking or a new approach. And if you're interested in talking about this, I invite you to come in, log in at Computers 2K Voice or come in at 919-518-9773. Talk to me. I believe my advice is coming from a very strong foundation of truth and a reality that we all live in. And I'm piercing the conscience that it's – I'm afraid to take that step. And I'm suggesting the step is not as big as you would think it to be. The walk from here to Rome starts with a step, one step at a time. And the first step doesn't have to be a big one, and it can just be, I love you, my child. I love you, my child. I learned something tonight. I've learned something over the past three, four weeks that made me need to come to you and say, hey, we're coming to a new year. We're coming to a great time of the season. And I got to I gotta come to you and say, let's start afresh. Or let's not start afresh, but let's start a journey. Make it a New Year's resolution. I don't know, but just pierce the first step. I promise you I will be there to help you if you can embrace the first step. The first step is having that conversation and opening up the dialogue because the God's honest truth is the kids in the auditorium, their actions rock the teachers. There are kids in that audience that are crying, that are leaning against each other's friends they know that each other's parents, they all admit that this has happened to them and all of them want their parents to step in. I was speaking to someone last night and he was in the, in the realm of education and he's seen these kind of things happen. 
And he says, when you talk to the kids, the kids are a captive audience. You can fill the stadium, the room, the auditorium with two, three, four, five hundred kids. But when you do the outreach to the community for the parents to show up, you get a less than 10 percent participation because the parents are saying it's not our kids. Our kids aren't involved in that. The kids are saying, holy smokes. And he said, what would you do, Ryan? I said, you know what I would do? I would do the same presentation and put a curtain right down the middle of the wall and not let the kids know the parents are there and just tell the parents that their kids are over there and let the ears do the talking and let the parents hear the deaf, the, the silence that a pin could drop with how many kids sit down the first time. And when I asked that second question and that the, there's dead silence and it's followed by tears and it's followed by emotion that these kids are crying, I dare those parents not to be convicted. I dare them or they need, they need therapy because they are living in such a shroud of denial that they have, they go down their list. I do this. I have this. They put the computer in the same room. They have no, they, we have the same, it, the technology is not in the bedroom and we give them certain screen limit times. But honestly, there's no oversight. They see nothing. What is created for me? So, that, and then I say, well, I'm glad you got everything under control and that you've got that webcam covered up because heaven forbid somebody's hacked that webcam and it's seeing right into your house. Oh, wait, what, what are you talking about? No, you've got this under control. You've got this totally under control that you know your child isn't live streaming that I can download or I can pull up that little red dot on Periscope and find how many kids are broadcasting right out of the high school. You got that under control. That's that's. I understand that it's easier to disconnect from this message based upon this little little area of comfort zone that we want to maintain. But the truth is, the consequences for those children are permanent, and you can gamble on that permanence. I, I'm telling you, there's fallout. There's lots of fallout. And there is also success. There is success with those that are taking a different approach by being proactive in, in their kids with their digital media. Because I am talking to people that are talking to educators that are talking about the permanence of the impact of the internet to the kids. This is not parents. This is the educators. And they're saying, talking about the importance of a LinkedIn profile and building a resume and this activity you do on Twitter or you do on Snapchat erodes your professional viability. Only having a success at the higher grade levels. But the teacher is also admitting that the child, when he leaves home, has still got this dichotomous life that there's this other activity that's done under anonymity where they're getting their release from, from this structure. They want this freedom. And they're trying to create that isolation. So I'm saying there are successes out there, but the kids are very crafty in on how to create that isolation and difference from distance from that discipline. Hey Ryan. Yes. Uh, I want you to go back to the the kids that were bombarding that poor kid who is probably in a better place now. The kids what that, the, the the kids that caused it the oh, kids the, that were on the other side that were being mean what's going to happen to the kids that were being mean what I mean do does anybody know who they are oh yes okay so that's a great question so um, Eminem was asking me what what about those kids? So that the young boy that has taken his life and what this social media fallout looks like. Um, I honestly don't have the intestinal nor mental nor emotional aptitude or fortitude to go and ferret out all of those kids. I've got this that I'm working on that is just affecting my own personal life. This is my personal life that I have to work on 
and there's so many more that I have on lists of paper that I cannot even get to. So these children are identifiable. These individuals, let me not say children, these individuals that did what they did for that period of time are identifiable because the internet is permanent. It is totally permanent. So I haven't, I will have to seek legal counsel and I'm going to have to seek emotional counsel on this because. This child is gone. The parents don't know why. Here is the, the volume of evidence that shows why. We have people pushing him to the point of suicide. And the law has recently found that a young girl that was encouraging a boy to commit suicide is criminal. Now, I don't know the status of that case, but she was charged. So those people that were making those volume of threats, there may be a statute of limitations. I don't know. But they are definitely culpable in contributing to this child's state. So I am not capable of going into the research to identify and expose them. I, that, that is not my job, and it is not something that I can even mentally go and do. But those parents – may, based upon what I eventually tell them, go seek legal counsel to go and find all of those people and determine how they may want to legally proceed. But it's a two-sided two -sided coin here, unfortunately, because the other side of the coin is that is an, a reaction of punishment to mask their own involvement in a in avoiding what was happening. This is years of them choosing not to participate and see. Remember I said I didn't want to tell you what the symptoms were? I didn't want to tell you what those triggers are that you should be looking for because I'm fearful that once I start sharing them with you, it's going to resonate and you're just going to go and turn off the program. I don't want you to turn off. I want you to embrace this as, a, as an opportunity to reconnect with your child in a way that the children most desperately wants you to connect. And I see this as an opportunity, not as a challenge. How awesome would it be to put the TV remote away for a half an hour and to have a conversation once a week about this specific topic and to start from the framework of love, that I love you and I just need to be caught up to date. And you know what? We may have to do this more frequently because we just found something here that which is, that's more dangerous than you and I even considered because this happened here and we both need to figure out a way for a plan. I shared with you, my friend, that had that visibility on his child and was able to recognize when the texting stopped that his child had gotten an encrypted text app on his phone that he could respond to it and the child was happy that he signed a contract, signed an agreement. He was happy, the child was happy that his dad saw it and took the step. And the dad is sharing with me personally how powerful that was in his relationship with his son. And they already had a good relationship. They didn't have a bad relationship, but this just made it that much better. So t t the answer to the, the question is, are those people identifiable? Yes, they are. Is there the possibility that there could be something that could happen to those people? Yes, there is. Am I going to be in the stream of how that happens to be determined and whether that is brought to the parents in its entirety to be determined because I, I am in the midst of this and I've got it swarming all around me and I have people that are bringing to me daily people, kids that are at risk. So um, – Yeah, but, but Ryan, if nothing is done about it, 
for some reason, I'm not, my, my voice, the audio for me is coming through really poorly. Let me put it on the... Oh, can you, you can't hear me? It's all garbly. Oh. Mm, okay. I was, I, can you understand what I'm saying? Let me see if I can get it on my out, um, on my speaker. Okay, try it now. Um, if, there we go. If we don't learn from this unfortunate situation, then that kid died in vain. I, I cannot disagree now, with that. Now, wait. I'm not yep. saying that you should be involved in that. It's not your place. I mean, yes. you bring us the information. Is the law not going to do something about it? I mean, shouldn't they be doing... I'm not talking it's, about the parents. I'm talking about the law. The law should be looking into the reasons why the child committed suicide. And do you know if they are doing this? I or are they no, failing? I have no knowledge to that. Okay. That's outside of my knowledge. Okay. But your point is correct. But there are many deaths and major, many traumas that are happening on the Internet that are in vain. That... I have done periscope after periscope, sweet 16th birthday parties where drugs and alcohol and live streaming are happening. And this was a great teaching moment for the school and the peers that went, went to rot. The, the rainbow party that happened at the sports complex was a great teaching opportunity because multiple parents lost their jobs. One father is on the national predators list because of this transgression great teaching opportunity that will be wasted in vain. So I, I am sensitive to it. And it's really up to the victim, the parents in this case, to become advocates themselves, which is, and sometimes they do. But most people want to hide from their pain and they don't want to illuminate their pain. And I, I agree. Um, and... I, I don't know. I, I, have a, I have a sense of a level of sadness in my heart in that I see it so often and so frequently and to such a degree and the children screaming out for it and the teachers telling me that the kids are screaming out for it. The teachers themselves are saying it to me in private sessions. It's like, what are the parents doing? We can't get parents to show up at the school. <laughs> yeah, but they've got other time commitments. Baloney. Baloney. Yeah. If you had tickets to go to the next NBA basketball game or football game or whatever, you would find a way to get there, but not for a child's event. Yeah, it's a double shame. It is a double shame. Well, I I appreciate you coming in and talking to me. <laughs> well, I don't I mean there so far there's 1500 people that are listening. But there are only two of them that are logged in, I think. Yeah, there are only two of them that logged in. And which is a very, it's a very I unusual get... phenomenon. I don't know if this is because of, I don't know what other broadcasts are like. Uh, I have nothing to compare it to. I know what my periscopes are like, and I know what happens in the communication afterwards. Um, this is a, a, a bit unusual. It's a bit unusual. And I appreciate Patricia or Durham Skywriter saying. Hmm. Um, but it's people will listen. That they will do. Well, but they are. They, act? they are That's, listening. They are they, listening. So they, and, and Yes, they are listening. But are they acting? I'm telling them I will give them a free child agreement. All they need to do in order to get that from me is just give me some way to give it to you. Come on, I guys. I, I, that I, I don't know what to do. I can give you more stuff if I knew where to give it. Yeah. But there's no way for me to give what I have unless you're willing to receive. It's like it's Christmas time. I've got a present here with a beautiful bow on it. I want to slide it across the table to you, but you have to reach out and grab it. And nobody wants to grab this beautiful present I have for you. And it's my Christmas gift to you. And it's about your kids. 
and it's got a great big gushing heart inside of it called love to love your kids and keep them safe. Well, maybe they don't want to show themselves here. Can you tell them where they can get yeah. in touch with you so they can get it? Yes, they can get me at parentdome.com. And if you go there and if that is is if that's too much and you want to have I, I don't know how to give you the distance and separation you would desire. You can find me on Twitter. That's great cuz you can be anonymous on Twitter. You it's a free account, it's a free service, and if you want to be anonymous, that's totally cool, and I respect that. Just set up an account on Twitter and send me a message through Twitter, and my name on Twitter is at, the at signed, parent underscore dome. And that's totally cool because if you connect with me on Twitter, I can give you this information freely and you can I don't need to know anything about who you are. That's a great point, Amnon, because there is I do understand this fear of admission. I I get that because it's I mean it's like nobody wants their dirty laundry out in public and then I wouldn't want my name in the chat roll making any statements as well. I that's a very good point. So I'm glad I I'm glad you suggested it and glad I thought of it. Twitter is super just set up a simple free Twitter account. Doesn't matter if you have nobody in there. Just create up a <clears> bogus <throat> one, and then tweet at parent underscore dome, and I, just say. I think if you get a little a little boring, more people will participate because all the shows are like that. Whenever the host or the guest are just pouring information out there, the audience in general, does not want to interrupt. They want to be able to take as much as they can because that's what they're here for. Yes. And and that's what happens. So, like on my show, sometimes we'll just stop talking and say, look, you're not going to participate. You're just going to hear quiet for a little bit. And <laughs> people will... <laughs> And and that's that's fine. I can put music on in the background until somebody wants to come and join me. <laughs> uh, no, no, sorry. No. no, that's that's good. So that's that's um, that will conclude the show, I guess, Amnon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Well, thank you very much again, sir. Well, tell everybody again where they can find you and. Yes, everybody, you can find me uh, on uh, parentdome.com. If you send me to Twitter, I have a sheet that gives you all of, all of my archived content. My periscopes are action-packed, valuable content that is, you can enjoy in your leisure and is free. It's just out there. There's 300 episodes, and I go through the reality of what's happening. So that, that's, that is available to you. Um, my Periscope, I'm active on Periscope, which is another free thing that you could, could visit. And then my website at parentdome.com. All right. And um, so let's finish this. And you need to go into Blab because there are some messages there for you. I will so go I'm over. Not, to I'm not going to shut down the Blab. So talk to you later. Thank you very I'm, much. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm stay here. It's fine. Well, I'm going to open Blab in a yeah. new window right now. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam, with NCBBI members, The Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet, with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net.